Thanks, Nathaniel. Uh, morning, all, and welcome to Members Hour. Uh, I'm Jemima Cooper, the Institute's Policy Manager. Um, this is a bit of a special edition of Members Hour today. Uh, ICF is one of the Society for the Environment's 24 licensed bodies um, with the license to offer chartered environmentalist status. So SOC Enver are running a spotlight series um, with each of their licensed bodies, uh, sort of one of their licensed bodies each month, and this month is our turn. So we're really excited to be able to showcase what it means to be a chartered tree professional and a chartered environmentalist. Um, just to note that as part of the Spotlight series and in a slight break from, from usual members hour form, this session will actually be available afterwards on the SOC Env YouTube channel. Um, so just to flag that with you. Um, and a lot of the ICF staff team are in a council meeting today, so sadly can't join us. Um, but if you have any answer, unanswered questions after today, um, Stuart and Ben in member services wanted us to encourage you to contact them um, at any point to discuss your path to becoming a chartered environmentalist. And Sarah Ridgen of SOCEN has kindly joined us today to help with questions. So we've got a, a nice dynamic format today with three of our CN members here to give us a flavour of what it means to them in their work. And uh, we're hoping for plenty of discussion, um, so do put thoughts up in the chat as we go along. We're very pleased to welcome Dougal Driver as our chair today. Um, Dougal will be known to many of you um, as uh, in his role as CEO of Grown in Britain, but he's also been very closely involved with the Society for the Environment for many years, so I'll let him elaborate on that. Um, but essentially, he's very well placed to set the scene on what it means to be a chartered forester and a chartered environmentalist. So over to you, Dougal. Jemima, thank you very much indeed, and good morning to old friends and, and some new for sure. Um, uh, please do make this as interactive as possible, really. You don't go away from the next uh, 50 minutes without getting a question answered that you might want answering. Um, got Sarah from the Society and Jemima from ICF. Um, so please do ask, ask away. Um, just a little bit more on what Jemima said about my involvement with the Society. Um, I got involved over, over 10 years ago now. Um, and... I became a chartered environmentalist. It was important for my work at the time and remains actually very, very important for my work now. And you, you, the foresters amongst us will smile um, when the board and the members who vote for people to have uh, office positions um, didn't kind of realize that I was from the woods really because I'm now vice chair of the society and no one's really noticed. I joke because it actually I'm very proud to be vice chair of the society because it has given me a real insight into all of those different institutions that uh, Jemima talked about and the professionals that work within them. And um, before I introduce Robin and uh, Margaret, who are going to share some of their experiences, um, I should have introduced myself as a chartered environmentalist and that that is what I often do these days and the reason I do that is because it it just takes barriers away um, and when you're working with other professions from whether it's waste or water or soil and of course our our if we call it our sector for the moment um based around the institute's chartered foresters our world's just been opened up by all of these other things that are now sort of hitting the buffers, if you like, our core profession. Um, we've always known that um, we've had these links to all these other sectors, but for it to um, come out professionally, being a chartered environmentalist is really important. And actually it's, very, it's a very transferable skill as well. If you're thinking about career, you, can, you could apply to work for a construction company, uh, energy company, or something to do with water or waste, a local authority, a government department, overseas. CM status is a global status, a professional status globally. They're all over the world. And you can, you can apply for jobs in that sector. And of course, there are so many environmental jobs coming up through ESG and uh, the pressures of climate change and, and net zero. That having that status is incredibly transferable and, and, and it is of great qualification to have as well to show your professionalism in, in that area so um it's really I, I really really encourage you to get involved if you're not already involved um i won't say any 
too much more now, but a little bit more, just a couple of things I do for the society. I lead for World Environment Day for them, which, um, and SOCEMV is really the lead, arguably, in the UK for delivering World Environment Day, in, which is 5th of June each year into the UK. And um, we, we help bring together all of the institutes within the family to um, really have an impact around that time. And I also am the chair of judges for the Environmental Professional of the Year, which is the annual awards. Um, we have a, a, a also a, an award for the, the, the best sort of newcomer into the set into the environmentalism as well. But that's a really prestigious global award, which um, uh, I'm chair of the judges for. So just to give you another insight as to the depth of my involvement in that particular organization. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Margaret to briefly introduce herself and then I'm going to go to Robin to introduce himself and he'll roll into his slides and then we'll we'll come back to Margaret to do some a few slides and, and chat and then we'll go to Q&A after both of them have spoken. So just to, uh, again to say what Nathaniel, Nathaniel said at the start, put your Q questions into, into the chat. So Margaret, if you could just briefly introduce yourself, please. Uh, many thanks, Dougal. And thanks to the ICF for inviting me to contribute this morning. Um, first and foremost, I'm a chartered environmentalist, somebody who's been um, in and around the tree world for 40 years. Um, and hopefully I can give you a little flavour of uh, my route to becoming chartered, um, following Robin. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, thanks, Dougal. Uh, Robin Truslove. Uh, I'm a chartered environmentalist. Um, so uh, I've been working as a chartered forester uh, and now uh, more recently professional soil scientist uh, with Nicholson's Lockhart Garrett for 20 years. Um, my route into the industry was as a forester, uh, getting an MSc from Bangor University uh, and the role of uh, wooden creation and management um, evolved into um, doing that work on minerals and waste sites as well and that role uh, has evolved again over the last five years into providing soils advice for sustainable reuse uh, and um, for land restoration. So um, I can move into uh, sharing my presentation uh, Dougal and uh, yeah, that, that would be That'd Sorry to interrupt you, Robin. We, um, your camera cool. is uh, still switched off. It would be great to be able to see you. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, it says it's on my end. Um, so let me see if I can. Um... Yeah, there you go. There you Hopefully are. Have me now. Apologies. OK, so um, right. I'll share uh, a presentation. Um, so. Is, is, uh, is that visible now? Yeah, it's coming yeah. through. Fantastic. So I'll uh, start to scroll up, scroll down. OK, so um, first few slides just just really outline the role that I've mentioned. Um, the, um, uh, the core of my work is uh, lowland forestry in the Midlands, um, but we do have a uh, sites around the country um, and yeah th those are some uh, oak milling logs um, uh, felled from an estate in East Warwickshire um, which were 200 years old uh, a really good you know uh, economic income for, for the owner who was able to then restock that that area with uh, native broadleaves uh, as the next generation. Um, soil science as I mentioned so um, what you're looking at there is a soil profile on um, so, uh, uh, limestone brashy soils in Northamptonshire, uh, which I surveyed recently. So um, that, that's uh, probably sort of 30 percent of my role. Uh, and then the, the photo on the right there is um, a, a habitat translocation project uh, in the Midlands. So um, woodland was needing to be uh, removed from major infrastructure project um, and uh, my remit was to um, supervise the um, uh, the sort of uh, the translocation of the woodland topsoils from a 
the original woodland donor site onto a receptor site so that that bank of um, microfauna uh, of uh, wildflower seeds, of tree seeds, of mycorrhizal fungi was not lost as part of the development and was carefully moved uh, uh, and replaced um, with, with very good success as, as turf, as you can see in that slide, in that photo. Okay, so it's a multi-function uh, role. And what I want to get across in this brief presentation today is um, how the decisions I make across each of those disciplines um, uh, improve the environmental credentials of the uh, of the site and of the land use, um, and what being a charter environmentalist means to me. Um, fundamentally, they they have to be environmentally sustainable, but they've also got to be economically sustainable. That it's it's a client's business that they're running, often not their core business uh, on the land we're managing. So that that's really important. Um, yeah, and and some of the um, uh, the bullets I'll go through shortly. Um, I'd just like to add that the you know these are decisions that I have actually made, and and, and a number of them have been actually on the same site. So it's a it's a genuine multi-purpose role as a forester and a soil scientist. Okay, so starting with the forestry aspects, um, the major policy document which directs the work of a uh, a chartered forester as a chartered environmentalist is the UK forestry standard. So that's up there in the top right. This is a document published by the Forestry Commission. It looks at all aspects of woodland management uh, and good practice environmental protection. And it's actually quite a practical, usable document that the foresters will pick up and refer to. You know, if, if they come to, we have a scheduled monument in the wood what's the best way to approach the consultation and to, and to protect that feature uh, during harvesting operations. So I'm just gonna draw out some aspects uh, of, of forestry, which literally are, are chapters of this, this document. Um, so in terms of landscape, um, as foresters, we need to think uh, about the, the, the scale of uh, planting, but also felling coops. Um, so the picture at the, at the top there uh, comes from the document and is a proposal for um, planting uh, on a you know an upland site, and you can see that that photo shows um, you know um, natural interlocking uh, shapes, mixtures of broadleaf and conifer. Um, it doesn't obscure the uh, the important viewpoint at the top of the hill. Um, it's you know that that's been thought about carefully uh, so that it protects the landscape. Habitat, um, obviously woodland is a, a fantastic habitat, um, not least for you know, birds, bats, and a number of European protected species, otters, dormice. Um, but in managing that woodland, we've uh, got to be thinking uh, about uh, protecting those species, especially during breeding periods. Um, so timing of works is absolutely key. Um, first and foremost, we need to uh, have, have done our background checks on uh, NBN Atlas to see if we have any protected species present. Walk through the woods, um, you know, see what we can identify um, in terms of protected species evidence. But the photo there is, is of a red kite, you know, a, a species very successfully reintroduced in Northamptonshire to woodland and expanding its range north to where I'm sitting now in Loughborough in Leicestershire. Um, and we need to be, uh, you know, if, if they are nesting, we need to be aware. We need to have standoffs in place for, for tree felling and harvesting, um, you know, getting the right, you know, ecological support for that. Uh, soils, um, so the picture in the bottom right, the, 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 you know, these aren't all lovely glossy pictures. That, that clearly is a, a clay soil in the woodland that's been trafficked when um, it's been waterlogged. And that is, that is significant damage. And that's something we, we must avoid um, the waterlogging, the compaction, then it means things like uh, oak sedges and rushes are gonna to start to colonize that area and choke out things like bluebells and, um, you know, dog's mercury. So it, it, it's, you know, it's a balance. Some woods we can't go in, in in the midsummer months that are driest because we don't want to disturb the bird nesting habitat. Equally, you know, we don't want to go in, in the depths of winter when it's it's incredibly wet. So, yeah, this, this is the, these are the decisions we have to make. 
uh, water. That is a nice picture of a mountain stream. Um, so, but the, the reason for putting that in is um, uh, I've been involved with a site where the uh, brook running through was a triple SI and we needed to fell some conifer off a bank adjacent to that stream. Um, again, it was an important timing question. Um, if we did that in uh, months of heavy rainfall, there was a risk that um, you know soil erosion could take place and soil would be washing down into the stream as an important habitat. So yeah, um, all of these things to consider. Um, and more, as I say, all chapters of the, the forestry standards. So um, timber, managing a, a, an economically an economically sustainable woodland um, uh, needs to make the most of its timber crops uh, and sell them for a good price, harvest them sustainably so that they can be renewed. Um, so uh, the um, uh, you know the, the, this is a this is a vital part of, of the fact that the woodland is is there at all. You know if it can help to pay its way um, through regular thinnings. Um, uh, you know, some, sometimes selection felling and replanting, then it will help to pay for things like the ride management, things like controlling the squirrels, which are absolutely vital in broadleaf woodland. An allied timber income uh, and economic sustainability is um, the, the alternative income streams that woodland can provide. Um, game, uh, woodlands provide excellent cover for wild birds, but also for game. And the um, um, you know that that on some large estates is a, a big commercial enterprise um, through, throughout the winter. Um, the important thing as a chartered environmentalist is that the bird stocking rates in the pheasant pens, particularly in ancient woodland, are not exceeding current uh, guidance from Natural England from the Game Conservancy Trust. You know we want to maintain this habitat as well as make some some money out of the woods uh climate change right at the top of people's lists so the the tree you can see there is a liquid amber uh we are with increasing changes in uh, pressures from pests and diseases as a result of climate change and globalization uh with increases in temperature more severe rainfall events more severe droughts we're having to look at alternative species for planting, um, obviously that are sensitive to the habitat. Liquid amber, uh, hot hornbeam, hickory are examples of uh, alternatives to ash, which of course we're not planting now with, with ash dieback, um, now endemic. So that was a quick gallop through the forestry aspects of, of what I do. Um, into Dipping into the, the soil science aspects, so um, one of the, uh, the first um, tasks as a soil science scientist is to do a soil resource survey of a site. Um, the plan you can see on screen is a 50 hectare development site. And uh, my task was to do an agricultural land classification. I won't go into that detail, uh, but uh, also to um, identify the soil types. So what do I mean by that? Well, I, I want to know the, the key characteristics that are, that are going to uh, impact how the soils are reused sustainably. So uh, the, the uh, drainage characteristics of the soil, very allied to texture and structure. Um, clay, heavy texture soils will drain more slowly. Um, the pH, I can take a certain amount of that from uh, acid testing for carbonate in the field. Uh, but then I could also lab test for, for that. Um, so this this map shows that on this particular site, I split this into five soil types. So the yellow down the centre, we're actually freely, dra freely draining sandy soils in the, in the stream valley. And as you go up either side of that, um, the, uh, the depth of the soils reduced onto the higher ground uh, so there were shallower soils over limestone brash, over on the eastern side, quite clay soils over till. So yeah, why do I need to understand these characteristics? It's because 
for the development site will need these soils as a, uh, a growing medium for their landscaping. Um, ornamental beds. So this, this site is uh, due to uh, be a logistics park near the A14 corridor. Um, ornamental beds will want more sandy soils, higher organic matter. We, we did indeed find some of those. Uh, wooden planting areas. Well, frankly, they're, they're more tolerant of a range of soil types. Uh, higher stone content, not such an issue on a, on a wooden plantation. Sandier trees, uh, sorry, standard trees. Um, sandier material is better for drainage where you've got those big, you know, uh, quite costly stock going in. Uh, amenity grassland. Uh, so if that's being regularly mown, they need, you know, they don't want to have large stones in that soil. Um, wildflower grassland, uh, if it's uh, a soil that's lower in nutrients, so phosphate in particular, um, then that, that's going to be ideal for, for wildflower grasslands as part of the, um, uh, the landscaping design for the perimeter of the site. Um, so, soil type D, as I mentioned, very clay uh, textured soil over till, um, actually quite useful for uh, lining some of the swales and ponds in the mitigation design. So yeah, thinking about the resource we have and how we can uh, use it to the best of its abilities. Um, uh, okay, hit you with another policy document there, but the it, it's more of a code of practice that the DEFRA code for uh, use of soils on construction sites. So that document, it's a good guidance note and uh, basically that that's one of my references for forming a soil management plan. So we've done the survey, we then need to know how the soils are uh, moved, handled, placed, deepened possibly um, at, at the right time and move to the right places. So we're avoiding double handling within the site. And, and the map in the bottom right is a, a sort of schematic representation of which soils would be moved where, you know, and, and at what stage. Um, that's normally split out into separate maps because it's quite a busy plan. But um, yeah, the, this um, the soil management plan fundamentally is is uh, our way of guiding that reuse. The, the, the step after that would be soils clerk of works, where we actually supervise some of that work on site. So yeah, it's a multi-purpose role. Being a chartered environmentalist makes me think back about the forestry and the soils and how I can do those better and more sustainably uh, and I would recommend it to anybody um, as a, uh, a qualification to you know to fit with your your daily work and your role. Thanks Dougal. Robin thank you thank you um, some fantastic images as well um, really good to have an insight into into your work some some of which will be familiar to some and others not um, um, I'm going to come across to Margaret in a minute, but just to remind people to put questions into the into the chat. Um, and uh, so, Margaret, if you're if you're ready, I think um, the slides will be shared for you. Uh, I think that's okay. So, if this could be done, I'll hand over to you. Okay. Many thanks, uh, uh, Dougal. Um, well, they, uh, there you go. I'm a principal consultant, a boriculturalist and the insurance mitigation manager for a, uh, an arboricultural consultancy that um, covers uh, the, U the UK. Um, if we can, yes, thank you. So uh, what I hope to do in the next 10 minutes is give you a flavor of um, my current role and my career route to becoming uh, a chartered environmentalist. So uh, I joined the business in 2004 after 14 years in local government as a conservation officer, and preceding that, 12 years in private estate management of mixed woodland and amenity trees. If I was to try and convey or compress what I now do in one sentence, um, I would venture to suggest I, I work in the area of impacts or challenges caused to or by a tree. So the nature of my work now means that I'm involved in seeking 
to um, implement effective tree management solutions to problems arising from the inevitable or sometimes maybe not so inevitable conflict which can result from people, housing and trees occurring in close proximity over which we know frequently can be overlain legislation and regulation. The findings in Trees in Towns 2, published back in February 2008, reaffirmed that the amenity benefits we all enjoy as a result of urban tree cover are provided by many trees which are located in private gardens, up to two thirds. Of the remaining third, 20% 20 are, loca 20 are located in public parks and open space, and 10% are street or highway trees. As such, in our work now, in my work now, we seek where appropriate to use felling and repl replanting strategies, root barrier solutions, pruning strategies, and to be open to ongoing research findings when we interface with all professional interest groups who can impact on the homeowner. So trees, as we know, may cause indirect damage by disrupting or displacing structures or direct damage by parts of, or indeed whole tre trees failing. Trees can be damaged by events such as domestic oil spills, fires, flooding, or vehicular impacts. So the complex nature of a situation caused by, it's the complex nature of a situation caused by the convergence of locational, arboricultural, geotechnical, and structural issues resulting in a wide range of professional disciplines needing to interface. Trying to, trying to continually seek to improve interdisciplinary understanding requires the time, commitment to work with research groups and any professional discipline whose work includes defining the impacts of trees in the public realm. There is a wide variability of factors leading to indirect damage, including soil properties, building performance, climate, and individual homeowners' propensity to even report damage. Whereas on the other hand, simple lapses in concentration by your domestic oil delivery supplier can cause leakage of kerosene into domestic gardens. So where have my, where have my professional memberships um, taken, taken me in this work, including becoming a chartered environmentalist? Well, um, I was admitted to, um, uh, to the Institute of Biology back in 2003 as a chartered biologist. So when I came to the business in <clears throat> 2004, uh, I had a degree and as a, and as a chartered biologist. But that actually in 2004 would not have let, let me into becoming a chartered environmentalist because in actual fact, the society only got its, got its um, charter in 2004, <clears throat> excuse me. So I was admitted to becoming a chartered forester in 2007 and then to becoming a full professional member of the Academy of Experts in 2010 and then to becoming a chartered environmentalist in 2012. And I went, I've gone on to become a full professional member of the Expert Witness Institute in 2017. And I think we all know that professional memberships are a, a mark or an indication of your, hopefully your competency and a broad range of both academic and professional knowledge uh, applied to what we, what we do. So, can I just on, check, Margaret? Sorry to interrupt. Can I just check that you're on the the right? You're talking to the right slide. I know Nathaniel will be moving your slides. I'm forward. hoping. Um, yes, I'm hoping now that Nathaniel will go to the example slides. Okay. 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 Thank you. So, 
where has where does all of this get practically applied to uh, to what I can be involved in? Well, uh, so I've got three sides slits, three sides coming up. Um, this one is about, as it says, domestic kerosene spill in in a national park in Scotland, where um, I was in. I was instructed to come up and look at a, at a single aspen tree, as it says there um, on the road in, in a domestic garden on a road on the road uh, quite close to Calendar. And whilst it's a little bit faint, I hope it's possible to see that the environmental consultancy who instructed us. Um, has had already mapped out in parts per parts per million um, where the where the main ker kerosene spill was affecting the aspen um, and the the important the issue with um, kerosene is the uh, co the the content of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons which um, lock up the lock up the oxygen in the soil, if you will. Um, so after the environmental consultancy applied its treatment to the soil, uh, we're, we were instructed to come, come up and look at whether the, um, uh, the aspen could survive. Basically, that's what we had to, uh, had to advise on. If we perhaps m move on to the next one. So um, as we've, um, as, as I've already uh, referred to, what, what being a chartered environmentalist means to me is it's constantly in front of me in, in my work, particularly where either trees are damaged or trees have to be felled, that clearly we work in a, an environment that of legislation and regulation, particularly with regard to, pr to pr uh, protected species. I'm just gonna to touch on a couple of um, examples uh, that involved um, GCNs, bats and birds. If we can move to the next slide, ah, I, I, I think we may, might have jumped. Might have jumped. I think there's um, I think we might have jumped, Nathaniel. I hope. No. Uh, These oh. are the only ones we've got. Ah, um, um, okay. So we have um, a we we have. Let me just go and see whether I can, just bear with me. So as we know in with, um, sorry, just actually scroll down. With, with birds, I had, and it had an example, a couple of examples as recently as January this year of um, two, two properties um, uh, of, with uh, single mature trees in their gardens implicated in causing foundation damage to the, to the couple's respective properties. But coincidentally, both couples had actually um, erected owl boxes um, in, their, uh, in, in the trees. Now, it, so it becomes absolutely crucial to listen to and recognize one couple knew it was a tawny owl that had got, that had previously had been using the box. The other, other couple wasn't quite so sure, in fact, whether it was a barn owl, but, but obviously with, and particularly with, with um, tawny owls where you may not uh, disturb um, um, the likelihood of them coming back and finding the same nest, nest box, we had to take steps on both of those situations with both of those situations to ask the um, the homeowners to move the boxes as quickly as possible in January after reference to the RSPB because the particularly the tawny owl could have been looking to come back to nest in that box um, as early as March. So um, a few more minutes, Margaret. Yep, yeah. and then the same uh, on the same site. Um, if we can just go down to that uh, photograph. So um, we've had, we've recently had an instruction to go back to a garden that where a, a property was damaged by foundation damage 
uh, caused by trees two years ago, damage has come back to that house. The garden is known as a GCN um, uh, environment. So the insurers and loss adjusters had to, um, on our advice, uh, instruct a chartered ecologist to come and assess the habitat um, in terms of um, measures that would have to be followed so as not to disturb the habitat of the great crested newts um, during the summer months. Uh, so the repairs to that house have to, have to wait for the fact that the great crested newts are obviously going to have to go back into hibernation over the winter um, before any further um, tree, tree or vegetation management happens. And, uh, that, and that to me is a perfect example of where being a chartered environmentalist um, moderates, um, moderates the, the desire or the necessity to remove, re remove trees, um, uh, if you will, too quickly or without sufficient thought. One, one minute, Margaret. Okay, no, and, and I think that's probably I'd like to, I'll, I'll wrap up. I don't want to over, overrun, Dougal, so if, if, I, if I call a halt there. Okay, great. Start the questions. That's brilliant. Thank you, Margaret. Um, let me put my camera back on and Nathaniel stopped sharing your slides. That's great. Robin, if you could come back on camera and, and, and I'm happy for you guys to be unmuted. You're, you've got quiet backgrounds. Um, so, um, Dukes um, coming in. Jemima's going to also um, run through some process. I mean, for days to not only um, share some, um, you know, professional, you know, um, you know, do a little bit of CPD as had from our two speakers there, but also to encourage you to think about being a chartered environmentalist if you're not already. Um, um, Ross Weddle's on 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 the call attending, and Ross is uh, also a member of the Society of the Environment Board. And um, so, those of you who know Ross, you could you you know give him a call, see what feel what you know, find out what he feels about it. Um, and also, I, I encourage you to apply. Um, if you want to ask questions about the process, then do so today. We've got Sarah from the Society, and as I say, Jemima and the team at the ICF are absolutely ready to help you through that process. Um, those, of, those of us that have done it have found it a very rewarding thing to do. Okay, so um, let's get those questions coming in. I've, I've got a, a, a couple already. Um, Robin, um, there's, there's one specific question there about, uh, well, it's from Charles questioning your choice between liquid amber and hickory, um, as opposed to maybe, um, you know, what, what was felled, which was, was more native. Um, I, I, I assume you um, made some decisions around that to come to that decision. Yeah, no, th thanks for the question, Charles. And, um, you know, th this is absolutely core cool to why we're here. So I think the, um, <clears throat> you know, with, with climate change pressures, with pests and disease issues, we've seen ash uh, um, no longer be, you know, viable for planting. Uh, Coarse can pine, to be honest, Scots pine, I, I wouldn't be keen to plant anymore. Um, <clears throat> larch, the, the country is zoned in terms of larch, ri you know, risk for Phytophthora. Um, <clears throat> there are also um, concerns about uh, other plant diseases moving into Douglas fir, Western hemlock. Um, you have acute oak decline, uh, you know, principally in the southeast of England where the agrilus beetle is. I, I could go on. Uh, you know, we, we have a huge number of pressures and um, it, I think it's incumbent on, on all chartered foresters to consider uh, alternative species uh, where relevant. And, and I think that's the key to the question. Um, the, if you are, um, uh, you know, re restocking uh, a pause or an ancient woodland site, um, or even just a, a broadleaf woodland where you can see a carpet of bluebells and that probably just hasn't quite hit the ancient woodland register, you know, it's perhaps too small. Um, you need to think carefully about the existing habitats you have. Um, so if you have a, a triple SI woodland of ash, field maple, dog's mercury, um, then uh, what, what are your options for restocking that? Um, 
obviously oak, you know, good native. Um, but in relation to the ash, what, what could replace that as more of a sort of uh, fuel wood supply species, perhaps not, you know, high grade milling timber. Um, uh, but, but will also provide the uh, diffuse uh, um, uh, um, open shade uh, that the ash would. Um, in, in that circumstance, lime was another option uh, and field maple. Um, but equally, you know, the, the owners asking questions, um, okay, but how am I going to get that, that, that sort of, um, you know, intermediate thinnings, fuel wood resource out of lime and field maple? That's quite a big challenge. Silver birch, stop you, can I, thanks, thank, yeah. thanks, Robin. I'll sure. stop you there. Um, Charles, uh, as you've mm -hmm. come on camera there, just quickly, briefly, do you have a, a, a response back uh, to Robin? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And Robin, thank you. I appreciate your, your, um, your, your uh, helping out thinking around that, that topic. Ultimately, um, I think it's really important that we don't forget that um, environmental uh, work in, in its broadest sense uh, is pinning down ecological networks. And um, it's about, on basic terms, food chains and food webs. And if we don't think about those things in that interconnectedness that the ecological and silvicultural um, uh, objectives might, might um, lean on, then we could be missing opportunities to be true environmentalists. And I think um, we've got to consider and, and remember the terminology that's often used in farming is uh, nature-friendly farming. Let's not forget nature-friendly forestry. Uh, and I would suggest that we, we bring that um, uh, into our, our discussions as environmentalists, um, especially when it comes to invertebrates in particular, they're, they're very species specific when, uh, with their, with their um, uh, successional needs. Yeah, I'm actually going to, thanks, um, Charles. Um, I'm going to come to Martin's question, actually. Um, uh, nice to see you on the call, Martin. Hope you're good. Um, Woodland about woodland translocation. Um, it's 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 another one for you, Rob. Um, but could could be could be a general question as well. Um, the success rate, you know, around that success rate. Um, I don't know whether you've seen mm. that question, but um, yeah, question. Uh, I, it, that 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 is never easy, is it? Let's face it. Um, but you 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 feel it can be successful. Uh, yeah, I do, uh, and it, it's it's often a decision. Well, it's normally a decision uh, to, to translocate a habitat, whether it's a species rich grassland or, or a woodland that's made, um, you know, way above our pay grade at policy level. Um, and we have to um, find a way to do it that preserves that really important resource um, and protects it during the process and, and maximizes its, its success. So on the wooden translocation, this was unfortunately ancient woodlands being removed, which is the last thing a chartered forester wants to see. But as I say, you know, it's a decision that's been made. Uh, and it's, um, so so you start to focus on, okay, how can we do this well? Um, the, uh, the outline guidance we'd been issued with was to uh, strip the, the LFH layer, the humus layer, you know, which in this particular wood was only a few centimeters separately pile then strip topsoil uh, and then move the topsoil loose and replace the LFH on top of it. Now uh, I, I surveyed uh, the site and, and quickly realized that the wildflower resource in this wooden topsoil was of bluebell and snowdrop bulbs, um, arum lilies um, and, and dense root mats of dogs mercury. Sorry this is not all the same site these, these things you know different sites but um, we realized that if you were scraping off the LFH, you know, with a 16, 20 ton machine, um, you're going to start to damage bulbs fundamentally and, and you're damaging what you're, you're trying to move. Um, the sites I was involved with were, were relatively small scale, half a hectare, a hectare. So we said, hang on, let's take some technology from grassland translocation and see if we can move this uh, woodland topsoil in tufts. Initially, we said, well, hang on, are these going to be cohesive enough? grassland has a great sword to hold it together um the short answer was we tried it and yes there were you know uh, we were getting 70 80 percent cohesion in these turves lifted placed on a flatbed trailer moved lifted off again and, and placed on the receptor subsoils um in terms of 
it, it was a little bit more time consuming, but not much more than you'd think. You know, it was, didn't take double the time, you know, 10, 20, 25% longer, 30%. Um, in terms of success, uh, the reaction of that wildflower uh, and, and seedling the following spring was uh, infinitely faster than it had been on other sites that have been loose tipped effectively the you know uh, the material the growing material was still upright it, it, it was still where it was largely speaking uh, so yeah it, it did work very well sorry robin just to make sure we get through the questions claire mm. i've 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 given you about two seconds warning claire whiteman in the chat so that i'm going to come to you <laughs> uh, to actually ask your question direct thanks martin for that question um claire hi no i just wanted to ask whether you thought that um your becoming a chartered environmentalist changed the way that you post um the management recommendations that you made even though you'd been a chartered forester before and um, sort of similar to i just seen andrew andrew weatherall's comment there as well which i think is really appropriate it's just um trying to, the messaging on through the icf is that we're professional um foresters and that that includes a massive amount of environmentalism um and maybe we're not communicating that enough so what's the difference between having both and just having the ICF yeah. was really what I was trying to get to. <clears throat> do you know, I think, I think, I think you, I think you're at the heart of it there with that. Uh, Margaret, do you want, do you want to say um, something and then, and then uh, yeah. if, as brief as you can, Robin, and then I come to you and then I'll say something as well. Uh, well, this, I think uh, Claire, there, there's obviously value in both professional uh, memberships. Um, I think I probably get uh, uh, the idea of what you, uh, what you're saying. Um, people who cut trees down these days are maybe not regarded as particularly politically correct, um, but um, trees have to be managed or removed for um, particular reasons. And um, I think it's, in, it's incumbent on all of us to bring um, the widest breadth of professionalism uh, we possibly can to the decision that we, that we eventually make. Um, so uh, being a chartered environmentalist, to me, um, uh, if you will, br brings a finesse to also being a chartered forester. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I've, that's a word we're going to hold on to, I think. Uh, 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 Robin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, br briefly, uh, I became uh, a chartered environmentalist pretty much at the same time as becoming a chartered forester in about 2004. Um, and I, I think the uh, when people know you're a chartered environmentalist it, it 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 puts even more emphasis on you to um be balanced um uh, to think to think sustainably you know um no we're not just you know we, we could wait another week for that, that soil to dry out yeah of course we could you know there's a way around things and um you know my my wife knows i'm a chartered environmentalist and and uh, it's interesting you know she'll sometimes say to me you are a chartered environmentalist. You, you, you know, you need to be thinking about these things, and, and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an important, you know, sense check, definitely. Yeah, and there's some good stuff in the chat on this subject. I think, as I say, I think it's at the nub of it. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been a forester all my life. There's, there's some people on this call I was at college with in '85. Yes, that's how old I am. And. Um, my God, I've learned so much more being a chartered environmentalist than, I, than I've learned being a forester. And one of the reasons for that is um, you, you do by having, it's twofold. One, in becoming a chartered environmentalist, you learn a lot. You did, there is a process which we'll talk about. You can't just sort of walk into it. The other thing is you work with people who, you know, on, on an equal level. So you, you can, your peer group is huge. I mean, A, it's global, B, it's also across all of the professions. And you can, you, you know, I found it's opened up doors. And if you can open up doors to speak to somebody from a different sector, because they're also a chartered environmentalist, you learn from that conversation and people will, it's all about networking, isn't it? And doing things like this. Well, as a chartered environmentalist, you get invited to things on the society's website that might be run by um, engineers or, or, or water professionals, etc. A great, great comment there about ecologists. Um, and, you know, if you have that attitude that you know everything as a forester to do with the environment, well, then does everybody who's an in, who's, does everybody with another set of letters after their name know everything about what they need to know? 
we surely come across some professionals where we want to actually improve their knowledge about what we have at our core. So you can't have it both ways. So I think it's I, I, I'm very clear, as you can probably tell, I'm quite passionate about um, reducing any sense of arrogance from anyone with a professional qualification. The one thing about, um, you know, because the, the SOCEMV is like the Science Council or the Engineering Council. It's an umbrella body for many institutes within the wider environmental sector. So it is, an, it really does bring lots of things together. It's not, it's not direct competition. It's as well as. Um, so there's it, within, the, say, the Science Council and Engineering Council, there'll be lots of um, institutes that that come under those umbrellas. So um, there's perhaps a little bit of a misunderstanding there that it's sort of either or as well. It's definitely as well as that's that's my view. Now I may, with all my passion, have missed some uh, questions. So I will will come back to those. Um, I think because of time, what I'm going to do is go to Jemima on the process, because we had a couple of people ask about the process. And then um, if we've got time, I'll come back to any um, legacy questions in, in the chat. Um, so apologies if I've not got to those yet, but just conscious of time. Jemima, if you can talk about process, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, um, great. Thanks, Dougal. Um, and also, Sarah, do jump in if I go off piece, because you'll have the uh, SOC end side of things. Um, but effectively, because we're one of the licensed bodies it means that um you know we we run the process for our members and um, there's a page on our website now that um sarah kindly posted in the chat um which i will just post again now um which uh, talks a bit more about the process that you can also find the application form and some guidance up there um at the moment um icf uh, only offers the chartered environmentalist status but you can have a read there as well about um, what else um, you know, about the RN tech, so the technician um, level, which actually this year um, we will be looking at offering alongside our technical membership. Um, but but for now, so so to become a chartered environmentalist through through ICF, um, there's the application form, which involves um, talking a bit about how your experience um, matches the competencies. Um, and you need a couple of sponsors and a bit of, of your sort of background and your work experience. Um, and then you will go through to um, an interview, um, which happens alongside the PME process. So that is, um, yes, at, at that time of year, and it matches up with the same deadlines and things. Um, for any other information, please do contact member services. Feel free to ask any more questions in the chat and I'll do what I can today. Um, but also the, um, the ICF at charteredforesters.org um, email address, um, they will be able to help you more as well. Um, the other thing just to note is that um, at the moment, I know Robin said that he sort of went through both PME and, and CN at the same time. So actually at the moment, it's only open to professional members and to fellows. So, um, so you, you, once, you've, once you've sort of gone through your PME process, you can then apply to become a Chartered Environmentalist. Um, that is perhaps another thing that we might be looking at. I know this year we've got a review of our license with SOCENV um, and um, with technical membership coming in as well, it's a good time to be looking again at what our process is. Um, but hopefully that web page will help you and feel free to ask anything else and get in touch at a later date. So I'm going to do something, talk about high risk and just unmute and say who you are. If you've got any questions about the um, process, I think that's probably easier than delayed chat functions about process. Sure. It says something about, about requiring a master's degree. Is that um, how, how can you demonstrate a master's level of education if you don't have a master's? Oh, sorry, where did you say it says that? I thought I was just reading the bit on the link on the email, that, and then on this site you said um, in the application guidance, it says something oh, about. Um, Jemima, can can you just yeah, research that, that? Yeah, I will. That comes as a, as a surprise to me. I don't think that's the case, but I will have a look into that and come back to you. Um, it's Sarah. Does, Sarah, do you have a Yeah, can I just come in there? Um, so it's yeah. You need to demonstrate master's degree level of thinking. So if you don't have a master's degree, that's fine. It's usually um a written. You'll be asked to produce another written piece, basically, to demonstrate um that you do have that master's degree level of thinking. But yeah, it's really important to to stress that we don't, it isn't necessary to have a master's degree as long as you can showcase that you have that level of, of thinking and knowledge. 
Yeah. And I think yeah. the way that ICF sort of treat it is that um, if you've gone through the PME process, then then you've gone a lot of the way to demonstrating um, that you're sort of operating at that level, if that makes sense. So the bits after that that ICF manage um, will yeah will be the ones to look at. If that makes sense. There was a male voice. Uh, just it was to... it was it was mine. <laughs> is that um, Will? Yes, it is. Uh, Hi, Will. A quick question about sponsors. Do they need to be members of the ICF or members of the um, Environment Society or, or what? Uh, I believe they do. Uh, oh, that's a very good question. Um, I need to brush up on my process knowledge, don't I? I might have to come back to you on that. I don't think that they need to be either. Um, I think they just need to be able to testify to your work experience and that, and that what you're sort of putting forward in terms of matching your competencies are, are right? accurate, but yes. Yep, that's my understanding as well, Jemima, that they don't need to be either. It's just about showcasing that you have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, if, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, if, you, if anyone needs a sponsor, do get in touch. Um, if I can't help, I'm sure we can find somebody who, who wants. If you, um, I think it's useful to have somebody who perhaps does know uh, a, a bit more about both, both organisations. That's obviously got to be a benefit. Um, again, just... Um, it's my bad and I'll have to deal with it if you all shout at once, but um, we've got a few minutes. So um, anything else on process? Um, Tris, I know you asked about it and a few others did as well. I, um, any, anyone else? Uh, everyone clear? Um, I hope you're encouraged to do so. It feels, sounds straightforward. Um, uh, and um, I think I, if, if I'm sort of talking slowly so that people can shout. You may, if you haven't unmuted, you may be shouting at a screen. No one can hear you, but you might enjoy it. You need to unmute yourself. Second, th I'll do now with a few minutes left is Miriam asked, I think it was Miriam asked the question. Um, and there are lots of links with Andrew. Thank An Andrew for your input and Claire. But Miriam said about perception and that rather, you know, quite a superficial thing. We've been into depth, haven't we, about, th and actually I think, you know, can you imagine being, you know, an expert witness and you've got chartered environmentalist status? You can see how it might really have some depth to it. You can see how you might be invited to speak at a major conference because you're a chartered environmentalist and you're off, off around the world. But what about when you just meet somebody? I love Robin's point about his wife saying, well, you're a chartered environmentalist. You should recycle that. I know that's not what you said, but, you know, that's kind of what my wife would say. Um, so, you know, um, the perception side of it, I think that's probably because I am vice chairman of the board and I've been on the board for a while and I chair the judges panel and, you know, all that sort of stuff. I the perceptions have been really noticeable to me. I am treated totally differently when I walk into, say, an event as vice chairman of the society, as I have walked into events in the past as a, as a chartered forester. Now, that's probably more to do with the event, maybe, but actually I think it is about perception as well. I think there's something about being seen as part of, I don't want to say, the, it's not a club thing. I think it's actually, I think it is about values. I think it's actually about values and culture. Um, it just removes. Having said that, don't get me wrong. There are four, there are about three or four institutes within the water and waste space. You get those people in the room, and of course they'll they'll be saying we're better than you. I'm better. Than, you know, there's that kind of. But it's actually once you all get in a room together as chartered environmentalists, it just you're just all part of that same thing, and it's purpose driven. It's really, really is purpose driven. There's just there's none of that underlying agenda. So that, that's my view. Of it. That's what I see. And that's why I've been doing it. That's why I've stayed there and doing it so long. And I've got a, I've probably got a few years to go if they'll, they'll have me. Um, and I'll just check the chat. And like I say, Mike, Mike's off and shout. Thanks, Miriam. Um, and thanks, everybody else, for your, your comments. Any, any final comments anybody wants to make from our hosts in AICF? to get in touch to discuss further um so the member services team are, are very ready um so yeah do do drop us a line there you go the final slide there sarah um any have, have the, the website's a mine of information is it at socm website if people want to have a look and um anything else you wanted to say sarah um, nothing too much, just um, we also have the guidance webinars and I'll post a link uh, to those in the chat as well. Uh, people tend to tell us they're very useful and um, we've got webinars on all sorts of things, whether that's um, more CM insights about how uh, CM has been useful for them or, or the kind of more process side of things as well. So I would just encourage people to have a watch and uh, get in contact with us if they have any questions or, or the ICF, as Jemima said. Yeah. 
and just to say personally um i see the bar charts and the charts of different institutes within the society as its vice chair and the icf is is pretty dormant around this space can we get some numbers up there so the next time i'm shown a graph around the table i don't have to literally hide under the table when it comes to the icf please so um thanks everybody thanks for your kind words in the chat as well um enjoy the rest of the day and i'll hand back to, to jemima to close Brilliant. Thank you, Dougal. And thanks so much yeah, to Dougal as chair and our speakers, Robin and Margaret as well. It was really great to get a flavour of your work. And thank you everyone else for coming and get in touch if you have any questions and otherwise have a lovely rest of the day. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Bye. Thank you.